To celebrate Financial Literacy Month, we've launched a three-part limited series about the psychology of spending, where we explore the hidden factors that influence our spending and discover practical tips and strategies to help you make better financial decisions. Whether you're trying to save to meet a goal, manage your debt, or just get a better understanding of your relationship with money, we invite you to come along on the journey with us as we work together towards achieving financial freedom. Marketing can have a significant impact on our lives, and that includes our spending habits by leveraging our emotions, creating a sense of urgency, and influencing our perception of what's popular, valuable, and worth purchasing. I'm Megan. And I'm Drew, and today we're going to talk about how marketing influences your buying habits. So we live in an age of advertising. It's all around us all the time, and in order to stand out, different marketing companies, different brands um, have started utilizing different um, behaviors, different kind of psychological tricks in order to get you to be more likely to purchase from them. So we thought it would be a good idea as, as a, a brand that wants to try to help keep people out of debt to make you aware of these different tricks um, so that you are uh, better armed Exactly, because these things happen to us every day, and I think a lot of people probably don't notice how frequently it happens. So the first topic is social proof. Drew, can you talk to us a little bit about what social proof is? Yeah, uh, social proof is just this kind of idea that we generally like to go along with the crowd. Um, so this you see all over the place. You may not really realize it. Some of it is a little less in your face. Like for example, uh, on Amazon, there are two bits of social proof you'll see uh, whenever you're buying stuff online. One of them being uh, ratings and reviews. So both the, the how much the people like it, but the other part of it is just how many people left a review. Because generally you want to buy th the thing that you've seen that more people have also bought because there's something in that that makes it feel like it's more likely <laughs> to be the good product. I so, think my favorite example of that is TikTok made me buy it. So I definitely purchased a cheese grater because I had a coworker watch a video on TikTok and he purchased that cheese grater, but then he showed the video to me because the cheese grater was so amazing um, that I actually wound up purchasing it, but I also did see it on the TikTok made me buy it channel that a lot of people wound up buying that cheese grater. Well, did it turn out to be a good cheese grater or? It was great. It's actually really great. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Uh, but it, it's stuff like that. There, you know, there was a, a psychological study back in 1956 by uh, Solomon Ash. It's the Ash Conforming Line uh, Experiment. Basically, this was a, a study that showed this whole idea of conformity, this idea that we want to do stuff just because everybody else is doing it. Um, so in that study, it was it was actually kind of cool. It, it was that they had um, a room of participants that were told that they were taking a vision test. And all they had to do was they were given a line and then they were given three other lines, A, B, and C, and asked which of these lines was the same height. And it was very obvious. So let's say the, the answer was B. It's very obvious. But the, the in the study, what they actually did was everybody except for one person in that study was actually a stooge, meaning that the, the researchers had hired them to purposely give the wrong answer. So if the right answer was B, they told everybody to uh, answer C. But when they, when they didn't have the stooges, only 1% of the participants actually gave them the wrong answer. However, when they did that conformity test with the stooges, 75% now was giving the wrong answer because they were too afraid to stand against the crowd which is kind of like influencer marketing. We are strongly influenced by others. So whether it was the person getting influenced by the stooges or us getting influenced by our friends or even people that we follow on social media, but literally anybody can be an influencer, yeah. which is the kind of cool thing too, because you can be a micro influencer, which is somebody who has a very small audience, or you can be a mega influencer, somebody that's gonna probably be working with those really big brands out there. Yeah, and, I, and you know, getting on the topic of influencers, I want to step back and 
because I think it's important for this conversation that there are actually like kind of three types of ads. There is what's referred to as own, paid, and earned. Owned media is the stuff that a brand would put on their own social channels, stuff that they would post on Twitter. And it, it is a channel that they own. Paid is what we're probably used to. That's the, the ads that you buy, the ones you actually purchase to get on a, a billboard or, or whatever. But then there is earned media. Earned media is this idea of if I have a, a post uh, on Twitter or, or an ad or whatever that is, an article that maybe the, the brand has written, that that is getting shared on different social media channels. So now the traffic you're getting from that advertisement is been earned. And that one is, is kind of the holy grail for marketers because uh, one, it's cheaper. And two, it's that idea of um, something that has gone viral. You know, you, you do this big kind of Super Bowl commercial and that gets shared to all of your friends. Hey, look at that, that is now earned. You didn't pay extra for that. And that's like user generated content to be yeah. more specific. And you know, that can be anything from sunglasses or even new makeup that you've purchased. That is a really valuable piece of marketing. Yeah, but it's also very difficult for a, a company to try to do on their own. So what kind of happened with the advent of uh, influencers online, the, the rise of influencers, that brands realize that they can get that earned media a lot easier if they just kind of work with influencers to sponsor different posts to get their product shown in, in a, say, a, an Instagram or TikTok uh, post. And sometimes they just do it for products. So they might not even be getting paid. It's just a product um, that they're testing out for a real review. And a company is not going to send an influencer, if they're a good fit, a product that they're not going to like because then their audience, by default, probably is not going to like that product either. Yeah, I mean it's it's an extension of uh, you know uh, product placement in movies. So it is just the more modern version of that. I think another place that that really comes into play is even through giveaways and contests, because the brands are going to partner with perhaps those influencers so that they can host the giveaways and contests to their audience, so their audience can. Um, receive maybe that product and try it out for free. Uh, so that's a really great way of also getting user-generated content if somebody wins a contest or wins that giveaway. So let's uh, move on to some other bits of psychology that marketers tend to use. One is uh, a very common one that you may see all over the place is one called price anchoring. So price anchoring is this idea that you have, say, like a small, medium, and large uh, version of a product, um, and really the the small and large versions is to really get you to buy the medium version. Everything is relative to each other. So whether something is worth the money is is a lot of times based on like you know uh, if I gave you um, there's a two hundred dollar pair of jeans and a sixty dollar pair of jeans you're going to naturally think that there is something wrong with the six, $60 pair of jeans versus a $200 pair of jeans because it is cheaper. But $60 is also still kind of a good amount of money for a pair yeah, of it's jeans. It's a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, so, but if, if those were the only two options that I gave you, you're gonna assume one is better than the other. Um, uh, or you may think that the $60 is a much better value for you because it's, you know, uh, that much cheaper me, compared to two hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah, I think for me, when you know, I go to a website that has you know maybe three different prices listed. It's super important to read through what you get for each price point, rather than making that assumption because a free version might just be what you need. That's small. Um, yeah. You might not need that medium or large. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in general. What a lot of people tend to do in those scenarios is they look at the small and they assume that's not enough for them. They look at the large and go, that's probably too much for me. So let me go with the medium. It's like the, the bed, Goldilocks and the three bears. Yeah, you had yeah. to find the one that was just, just right. right. <laughs> Can you tell me about um, emotional appeal? Yes. Yeah, so both in traditional forms of marketing and through digital forms of marketing, there are different types of advertisements that we see that are there to play on our emotions. 
And what it's doing is it's trying to create those triggers to get us to make that purchase. And there are really great brands that are absolutely amazing at their storytelling. And their storytelling is what's going to sell the brand and sell the product to people. When you start thinking back about different commercials you've seen, you might start thinking of the holidays because Personally, I think the holidays are an absolute fantastic example because you see people pictured around dinner tables and celebrating together. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you can envision yourself being there because you envision your family and what those celebrations are going to look like. And then in addition to that, there's also cause-based marketing, which also falls under the emotional appeal. And that's when you start thinking about campaigns like the Real Beauty campaign that celebrated women and empowered women of all shapes and sizes. And also there was a brand that had um, a campaign about sharing a beverage mm -hmm. where that also created user-generated content because you were taking pictures with a can that had your name on it or your best friend's name on it or maybe your grandma. Uh, but it created that emotional appeal that you wanted to share that because you loved these people. So emotional appeal has really created a sense of connection. And so another topic is going to be FOMO, which yes. I think is a really weird acronym. Yeah. But can you tell us about FOMO? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we've all heard of FOMO, even if we don't really fully understand how it's being used. But it's the fear of missing out. It is the you don't want to be left behind. If um, Yeah, it's, it's a similar idea to social proofing. But um, FOMO is, is trying to take advantage of that um, things like, say, artificial scarcity. Um, so that is when you see a, a sale that is like, you know, you have two hours to for the sale to last. Um, and there are some less reputable um, marketing sites that will do that. But it, it when the clock runs out, it just <laughs> starts back up. It is always perpetually two hours. Yes, <laughs> I've noticed that too. I've been waiting to make a purchase on this website and it keeps saying sale ending soon. But I'm like, when? When are you ending? Because there's no start date. There's no end date. And upon my research, people were saying, this sale goes on all the time. It's not really a sale yeah. at all. But, but that, that that idea of like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. Will it ever be on sale again? Maybe this is my my only chance to buy this uh, at this price. That that fear is, you know, really hits people and, it, and it's it's effective. It's it's not always the best. Sometimes it's normal, but it's it's a very effective tool that marketers can can use in order to try to get you to buy stuff right now and not let you have the time to actually think about it and make uh, maybe what would be a wiser decision. Another thing that I think of when I think of FOMO is exclusive experiences that might be offered. Uh, and brands and even influencers um, can provide you know, VIP opportunities or limited edition products. And this, you know, it definitely creates that sense of exclusivity and excitement for users and for fans of brands. Yeah, and it's on, so there are a, a few companies out there that they use it as kind of, it is sort of their thing. There, there are um, different uh, product companies, I don't know a better way to put it, but they, they will do uh, drops, like they will do like this limited time, uh, like shoe that, you know, it's only gonna be on sale for these, for this week and then they supposedly will never sell it again, but. Yeah, or we've made 100 of this product. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and here's a certificate to, to prove that you were one of the few 100 that got it. That is another FOMO tactic. And then also travel and adventure. How many times when you are browsing your social channels do you see travel posts? Yeah. It's pretty frequently. Yeah. People are always going on vacation, it seems like, and that can lead others to feeling like they're missing out on vacationing too. And so that can lead to impulse purchases uh, that are travel-related products or experiences based on that fear of missing out on a particular destination or activity. So now that we know some of the different techniques marketers use, what is it that we can do about it? So the first thing would be don't be impulsive, which is really hard when you think that you really want something. But a tip for that would be to just maybe wait a couple hours or a day and ask yourself if you still want that item. Another great example would be stick to your budget. And this will help to ensure that you're not overspending on those non-essential items. Avoid comparison. 
one of my absolute favorite quotes is comparison is the thief of joy. So just remember that social media often presents an idealized version of reality. So avoid comparing yourself to others and their purchases. And then the last one, would be to unfollow users. If you see somebody that is consistently promoting a product or something that's really outside of your budget, you can just unfollow them so you don't have to consistently see it all the time. And that goes for email marketing too. If you're being tempted with those sales every single day, multiple times a day, just unsubscribe. Yeah, and I mean, Instagram has a mute button for a reason, so sometimes it's perfectly healthy to take a break. I agree. Thank you for joining us for this limited podcast series for Financial Literacy Month. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe because we'd also really like that our media.